Hi everybody, welcome back to our lecture series on organizational communication. Today we are going to be talking about power and not power as in you know electricity or a superpower if you will, but we're going to be talking about power and influence in a group, in an organization, and in a variety of different contexts actually because power manifests in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about today doesn't just relate directly to organizational communication, but other aspects of communication as well, from interpersonal to small group to mass media to organizational and beyond. So when we're thinking about power, we want to be thinking about, first and foremost, it's not something that we just hand back and forth between people. It's kind of like a, it, it's a fluid dynamic process and concept. And we oftentimes in our public discourse in our day-to-day -day lives, we talk about it like it's this thing that we can hand to somebody else or they can hand to us. And that's not quite how it works. And it really it relates to a variety of different variables and different contexts, which we're gonna talk about some of that today. So in our lecture preview, we're first going to define what power is. We will then talk about some of the different forms of power, as well as indicators of power, power resources, power distance, and then some strategies for balancing power and for producing positive power. Because power and influence are not necessarily bad things. So there can be positive forms and negative forms, and forms all in between. Uh, so it's not just positive and negative. So first and foremost, when we're thinking about power, we need to define it. And there are lots of ways to think about it. There are lots of ways to define it. There are lots of ways to categorize it and to look at different characteristics of power in different settings. But I like to think about it as really coming back to the ability to influence. And influence, specifically if we're thinking about from an organizational perspective, influence an organization's ability to achieve goals. Um, to set those goals, to determine what the organiz organization is and does, and whether we have an upward or downward communication, whether we are a tall or a flat hierarchy, um, thinking about the roles within an organization. So we have a lot to think about when it comes to power and the ability to influence. So if we're looking at the slide um, under the key concepts aspect or area, I just have influence. And any aspect that can be influenced within an organization, within a group, that is some area where we might see, use, or manifest power in a variety of different ways. So simply thinking about it, it's about influence. And from an organizational or group perspective, it's really about influencing the goals of the group or organization. So we have three different forms of power that we want to think about. They are dominance, prevention, and empowerment. Now these three different forms of power, they vary in how we'll use them and where they come about. And like most things in communication studies, they're not going to be as cut and dry as we like to think. So we have to be thinking about from a broad perspective how some of these different forms of power might manifest in different settings and different scenarios. So with our first form of power and dominance, while it might sound pejorative or negative when we say dominance, we don't typically think about that that as being a good thing, but this is a type of power where we have the ability to exercise our influence over others. So if you think about being in a leadership or a management position, and it's not just leadership or management, it depends on the group and the organization, but those are really simple ways to think about it. It's how are we exercising our influence, our ability to impact other people? How are we exercising that? How are we using that? And that comes back to the dominance form of power. Now you can use uh, dominance power in a positive way. You could use, say for example, um, you have a CEO of a, a major corporation uh, step in and decide that that company is going to do more profit sharing with people, or people lower in the organization. That would widely be considered a a popular or a positive thing, especially for those folks at the bottom of that organization. Maybe not so much folks higher up or in the middle, but that's the ability to exercise that influence. 
Um, I'm, I, I was recently reading an article, uh, if I'm re remembering correctly, it was Patagonia. Uh, the owners of that company um, turned it, I believe, into a nonprofit and uh, are now basically all of the profits are being distributed within the company rather than just directly to the ownership and the ownership group. Uh, so that's one aspect of where you know dominance power can be a positive thing. We can think about it in a positive light. But it's not always going to be positive, so we have to think about another form of power, which is prevention power. So this is the ability to negate the influence of others. So we see this a lot in our government and in our politics, and it's to a certain level designed that way. But you have you know, those checks and balances in place, and that's prevention power that's built in so that one aspect of the government, uh, of the executive, the judicial branch, they can't just do whatever they want, right? Because then we would have too much influence over one thing. So they each have prevention power built in. In any organization, you're typically going to have some prevention power built in. So obviously this is not the same scale as the government, but when I was going to school at Sacramento State University, I was on the baseball club there, and um, my second year on the club, I found myself in a position where I was the president of the, of the club, of the organization, and um, I didn't have other people to fill other roles. So I was essentially president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, travel officer, safety officer. I was filling all of the roles and the school came in and was like, well, hold on a second. You have too much influence over this organization. There's no oversight. These other roles are designed to have some prevention power so that we can make sure that you're doing the right things with the money and the paperwork and all of that stuff. So prevention power, again, it's a way to impede the influence of others. It's a way to counteract that dominance form of power. And the final form of power is empowerment. So this is a proactive use of power or influence to increase the power or influence of others. So empowerment's pretty tricky. Uh, it's where you're using your influence to give other people more influence. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing, and it really requires a lot of critical thinking and decision making on your part because ultimately you have to be thinking about is that person ready, are they in a leadership position? There's a variety of different factors and variables that come into play, and we often think of empowerment as being a good thing we're building each other up, we're sharing power, we're sharing the decision-making process, but that might not always be a good thing. Sometimes people don't want to be given more influence. They don't want to be given more responsibility. They don't want to be in a position where they have to add even more to what they're doing. Uh, so just for example, in my department at Sacramento State University, uh, the department is trying to kickstart a work group that kind of fell apart for a little bit and there are lots of people that think that it's a good idea they want to do it the department's trying to empower people to do it and to take the lead on it but there nobody wants to take the lead so we have a situation where everybody agrees that this is a good idea but nobody wants to take on that extra influence that extra bit of work and responsibility so empowerment we can think about it as being a positive thing but not always Think about prevention, not always positive, not always negative. Think about dominance power, not always positive, not always negative, usually somewhere in the middle. So we have to be thinking about it from a variety of different perspectives. But when we're thinking about power in general, so not just those three types of power, but kind of power overall, uh, if you remember when we were defining it, I briefly said, you know, it relates to influence. And it, I like this quote of the ways in which relative degrees of power are communicated in groups. These are power indicators. So these are things that we can highlight, that we can identify, that let us know whether or not somebody has power or somebody has influence in a group, in an organization, or with themselves. So one example right at the top is the ability to define. Now this is really important. So when we think about what something is or isn't, we can think about what is legal or illegal, what is right or wrong, what is good or bad, what is moral, what is immoral, what we should or shouldn't do. 
So when we are defining something, we are essentially engaging in a form of argumentation that's called a argument of definition. And if you remember back when we were talking about language, so a few modules ago, a few lectures ago, we were talking about language and how there's a certain aspect of our language, of our reality, that is constructed solely by the use of language and the way that we understand the world. Well, when we're thinking about that, that's a lot of stuff. So how we define something really determines a lot. And it can all go all the way down to whether or not something exists or not. If we define something or redefine something or change the way that we're thinking about something, we have the ability to define that, and that is an indicator of power. The second indicator of power is the ability to influence decisions. Now, this is a big one. So ability to define, that's how we think about things. Um, that's obviously a major factor. But when we think about influencing decisions and we think about organizational or group communication, we're thinking about specifically what is the group going to do? What are the group members allowed to do? What are the norms and the rules? What is right and what is wrong? What, who, who gets to determine what's on that code of conduct? Who gets to determine the mission statement? Who gets to determine uh, where, where bonuses go at the end of the year, right? So we have to be thinking about the ability to influence decisions. And this, again, while power is different from leadership and management, they sometimes go, you know, they're linked to a certain extent. So when we look at this last example here of what are the goals and objectives of a group, well, the leader, in a lot of circumstances, that's their job to determine what those goals are. So one of the key factors in leadership and having that influence is the ability to influence decisions. And the final ability here is a little bit more abstract, but this is the ability to communicate freely. So when we're thinking about power, when we're thinking about how we can leverage power in different situations and different types of power in different situations, the ability to engage, to communicate, to feel like you can communicate and engage in a different setting or in any setting, that is a form of power and influence because you have the ability to share your ideas and have your voice heard and valued. That is a form of power. So below, when we look at this, we see higher perceived power and influence equals more communication. If you think about for yourself, in your experiences in groups, when your opinion is valued, when your voice is valued, when you are talking with people who you feel comfortable with, who you know you can share your ideas with, and maybe they don't agree or disagree, but you can safely share those ideas, you're more likely to communicate, which therefore is going to improve the decision-making uh, processes of your group, improve communication, hopefully, if you're doing effective communication. But then when we think about it on the other side of this scale, we have lower perceived power and influence equals less communication. So when we think about a group um, or an organization or a subgroup within a group that feels like they are not valued, their voices are not valued, their ideas, their perspectives are not valued, they're less likely to share those ideas. They're less likely to get engaged. You're also subsequently going to have less synergy, less cohesion, less overall group engagement, and that's going to negatively impact your ability to process input, to to go through the throughput aspect of systems theory and produce a high quality output. It's going to negatively impact your ability to meet the goals that your leadership has set forth. So we have to be thinking about power in a variety of different ways. And the example I have below here is that voters who think that their votes matter, they are more likely to vote. Therefore, they have more influence. Voters who feel like their votes don't matter, their voices don't matter, are less likely to vote and therefore have less influence on what is going on around them in their society. And depending on how large you look at it, it could be your city, your county, your state, your geographical area, or your country of origin, or the country you live in. Uh, so it's a variety. there's a variety of different ways that we can highlight and think about power. So just to backtrack a little bit here, we have the forms of power, which are dominance, prevention, and empowerment. And then we have indicators of those different types of power. That's the ability to define, influence, and communicate. 
So we've talked about those two aspects of power, but now we need to start thinking about power resources. So when we think about systems theory and we're thinking about input, throughput, and output, we are thinking about resources, right? And input is fundamentally that acquisition of resources from outside of a group or organization, bringing them into the group or organization, and then hopefully using those resources to produce a high quality product at the end of what that group or organization is trying to do. So when we're thinking about power resources, we want to define it as anything that enables individuals or groups to achieve their goals, assist others in achieving their goals, or interferes in the goal attainment of others. So this is anything that enables individuals or groups to achieve their goals or interfere with somebody else's achievement of their goals. Well, that's a lot of stuff when we think about all of the resources available that could impact our ability to achieve our goals or that we could leverage to negatively impact somebody else's ability to achieve their goals. There's quite a few things we can think about. And a handful of them are on the right side of the slide, and these are types of resources. So first and foremost, we can think about information as a power resource. This is a big one, right? So we often, there's a common saying that knowledge is power. Well, the idea there is that if you have more information, if you have higher quality information, if you have more relevant, more current, uh, more accurate information, you can use that information as power to achieve goals more effectively for yourself, your group, your organization, or to negatively impact another group or an organization, um, or even an individual. So when we're thinking about knowledge, we're thinking about information, we have to be thinking about how do we use that as a resource, but also this circles back to why it's important to think about um, information evaluation and how to evaluate information critically. Uh, we have to be able to determine what is high quality information, especially if we want to think of it as a resource, because we do want to have those high, high quality inputs entering our groups and organizations. Number two is expertise, and this is quite clear, right? If you are an expert in something, you have some ability to influence a variety of different things related to that. So if we think about uh, accountants, so certified professional accountants, they have an expertise in accounting, and people will pay them money to access their expertise. That is a power resource that accountants leverage that they use to make money, to live, to pay their bills, to do the things that they need and want to do. Now, so expertise is a major one. You can think about lawyers, doctors, teachers, professors, uh, politicians. I mean, really anybody who has developed an expertise in any field, they can leverage that to gain more influence in different organizations to do different things to achieve different goals because they can use that knowledge and that expertise as a resource to help themselves achieve their goals and as well as their group and their organization. Then below that we have legitimate authority. Thinking about that as a resource, we want to be thinking about our title, um, our experience, our knowledge, our position. It's kind of the authority that we are given when we think about being put in a leadership position. We have that ability to influence others that's given to us, whether we're in a leadership or a management position. That's authority that is granted to us in those positions. And when we leave those positions, we leave that authority, that power resource behind. Naturally, we always have the expertise and the experience that comes from that, but we leave that legitimate authority behind. And the last one here is rewards and punishment. Now this is pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. If you think about your ability to influence somebody else, and if you have the ability to reward or punish somebody, you all of a sudden have the ability to influence them to do what you want them to do, to think the way you want them to think, to feel the way you want them to feel. And This is a pretty common thing that comes up when we're thinking about persuasive speaking in an argumentation or public speaking setting. Uh, how do we make it seem like it's a good idea for our audience to get on board with what we're talking about? Well, we want to make it seem like it's going to make their life better and reward them in some sense. Not necessarily, you know, here's some money or something to do this thing, but how do we think about that particular aspect? We have intrinsic and extrinsic rewards and punishment. So intrinsic is going to be something like when you um, get told that you did a good job or you get some praise or um, you feel good because somebody in a position of influence said that you did a good job. 
extrinsic rewards and punishment are going to be things like raises and money and those outside factors, those outside things that people in leadership and positions of power can use to influence other people to do different things. So when we're thinking about leadership management, we're thinking about power, we're thinking about organizations and culture and groups and relationships, we have to be thinking about power, again, in a variety of different perspectives. And it's quite clear, because I'm sure you all are aware of this, uh, there is such thing as power distance. So this is the way people in a society relate to each other on a hierarchical scale. So it's this idea that different people in different um, cultures and different societies, we have to think about culture and society as being broken down into a variety of different aspects. So in sociology, we can think about it like a macroscopic look. We're looking at an overall society, but we could also be thinking about it in a microscopic or a narrow view and looking at specifically what an organization is doing or what a group is doing. And we can think about that power distance. So how do groups in different settings and different cultures and different societies engage with power? And this is a, a pretty interesting factor that comes into play. So to highlight this, we're going to talk a little bit about culture. Now culture is a lot of stuff, right? So when we're thinking about culture, we're thinking about power distance, we're thinking about the way people in a society relate to each other on a hierarchical scale. So if we think about tall versus flat hierarchy, we're thinking about how do we kind of rank each other and rank people in our organizations, and then how do we interact with them? Now, there's two primary ways that we can think about power, power distance in relation to culture. We have low power and high power cultures. So a low power culture sees inequality as sometimes necessary, but equalizing relationships is better for every, everyone. So the idea there is that some hierarchy is good. So for example, you could have an organization that is based on a low power culture idea and the organization will exhibit some of these general values. So they will have equal power sharing, so they'll have balance, they'll engage. People in leadership and management positions will engage with subordinates or people that are lower on that, on that hierarchy and ask for their insights and engage with them and think about what they want to do, what they would say, and how they would function in a setting. Um, they also would discourage attention to status differences. So if you're in one of these kind of low power culture organizations or groups, it's not so much like I need to call you doctor or professor. Uh, I'm, you can just call me by my name, right? So that the idea there is that we're reducing that power distance and getting more to like a level playing field. And the last thing here is that challenging authority is seen as a good thing. So if you're in an organization where um, you feel like you have the ability to communicate freely, you can leverage that form of power, that power resource. You can challenge people in positions of authority and ultimately, if done effectively, this improves the decisions that are made by the group. Now on the other side of this, we have high power cultures. And these are seen as inequality as the basis of social order. So we have very rigid, very strict hierarchy. It's going to be more tall and it's going to be rigid and we're going to engage with power and power distance in that culture in a variety of different ways. So if you're thinking about from an organizational perspective, um, the low power culture, you could think about an organization where everybody's on the same floor and maybe they dress pretty informally, they engage on a more relational level, a more familiar level. And then on the high culture, high power culture side, that organization could be, say, more like paramilitaristic, or it could be very rigid, and there's very set standards for how you engage. So the military would be one, but also if you think about like a fire department or something of that nature, they're typically more of a high power culture type of organization. That's simply because they emphasize maintaining power differences. Now this can, you might be thinking, oh, well, that's not good, right? We don't want to be thinking about somebody being above or below us. But at the same time, if you think about if your house is on fire and the fire department rolls up and the fire captain is ordering firefighters around telling them what to do, and those firefighters are resisting and saying, actually, you know what, I think we should do it this way. 
All the while, time is ticking, your house is on fire, you want somebody who, and you want that organization where they're going to listen, right? And they're going to have that power difference and they're not going to question the authority right there. They're going to acknowledge those status differences from captain to engineer to firefighter. And so in a fire department, in a fire station, there is a fairly rigid hierarchy that is maintained for a particular reason. So the idea there is that we want to be thinking about power not as good and bad in general, but thinking about it in different perspectives, in different, from different ideas, from different um, perspectives. Again, I'm saying that word a lot today, apparently. Uh, we want to be thinking about it from a variety of different views. So once we identify power, we think about the types of power, the different types of influence, the different resources, the different ways that we can have power distance, we want to start thinking about how can we balance power because this is where um, we really get into some of the interesting strategies that we can use to negate power that's used for nefarious or negative means. So balancing power or defiance is the unambiguous, purposeful non-compliance. It is a prevention form of power and it's when we just adamantly, we're not going to do that. We are not going to do that thing. Why? Because we don't want to, we don't think it's fair, we don't like it, I don't like it, right? So just for example, um, when I was in graduate school, I was working for an organization and I was selling solar panels. And uh, we had a new district manager come in who wanted us to do things that I found to be unethical. And this was mostly because I, at that point, had spent a pretty good amount of time studying um, persuasion and attitude change and body language. And the things that they were asking to do, I thought they were unethical and um, coercive. So I talked to my manager and my district manager and um, my manager was very receptive of that, knowing my background, and my district manager um, told me that I had to do it if I wanted to work there. Well, I chose not to do that. I defied that, and in doing so, I just went and got another job. So defiance can look a variety of different ways, but that's just one real-world example where I defied a um, person in a position of authority, a person in a position of power, because I, didn't, I agreed on I didn't agree ideologically or ethically. So when we think about defiance, that's just, it's direct, right? I was saying, I'm not going to do this. But the other form of balancing power is resistance. And this is more covert. This is um, ambiguous non-compliance. This is where we choose not to comply, but we're not going to be super explicit about it. We're going to go about it in a, a more strategic manner. And we're going to talk about some resistance strategies right now. So we have four on the, on the slide right now. We're going to talk about five. The first one here is sluggish effort. So this is doing something slowly, doing something with minimal effort. We are just taking our time. And it's that situation, you know, where uh, you have a, a parent who's telling you to do a chore and you really don't want to do it. So you're just taking a super long time to do it because you're doing it. But you know, you're not doing it very quickly or trying very hard. And when you look back on that or think about it, it's like, hmm, had I just done it quickly and done it right the first time, it would have taken me a lot less time overall. But that wasn't the point, right? We weren't being reasonable or rational in that sense. We were trying to resist that power. Uh, the second thing here is called strategic stupidity. And this is acting like you don't know how to do something right? Uh, this is you acting like, oh, I don't know how to do that, or I don't remember that, or can you tell me again, or I missed that, or I just, I didn't see the announcement, I didn't see uh, the email, when really you did, but you just don't want to admit that you did, right? So acting like you don't know how to do something, you didn't know about something, this is a form of strategic stupidity, and it is a form of power resistance. Number three is the misunderstanding mirage. So you say, oh, I did this. You do something wrong on purpose so that you don't have to do it again. So it's like, oh, gosh, I, I'm sorry. I just, I don't know how to do this. And then you get to a point where somebody says, oh, gosh, I'll, I'll just do it. And then we get to this idea, uh, this fairly common saying, right? If you want something done right, you do it yourself. 
Well, I think, I suspect that that's, that particular saying stems from a lot of this misunderstanding mirage. And the last one here is selective am amnesia. This is strategically forgetting about something. Oh no, I'm so sorry, I forgot about the meeting. I forgot about this thing. And really you didn't, but you know you have plausible deniability. So you say that you forgot, but you didn't really forget. You just didn't want to do it. So these are some of the different forms of power, some of the different strategies we can employ. Uh, you may or may not have done any of these. Uh, personally, I've engaged in all four of them. Uh, but they can be ways for you to resist that power without having to be defiant, without having to be direct. Because there are some situations where being direct is not always good. Um, you might be in a situation where you can't just quit your job selling solar panels and get a different job. At the time, uh, I could, so I did, and uh, there have been other situations where I've engaged in these different strategies. Um, but one of my favorites that I saw recently on the super popular show House of the Dragon was tactical tardiness. And this is where we purposefully show up late um, and we do it on purpose to draw attention. So we're gonna, we're gonna watch this video um, hopefully, hopefully you can hear it uh, on, on the recording, um, but I will, I'll share the link if not. Reaching back to the days of old Valyria and the age of dragons, when House Targaryen and ha All right, so this particular clip, right, it shows somebody who is the, the queen entering late, and it's purposefully late, and before, earlier in the scene, they were asking about where the queen was. And this, I just saw this, and I thought that it was a perfect example of tactical tardiness. You show up late to show that you're, you're there, but you don't necessarily want to be. So when we think about these five different resistance strategies, we can think about things from a variety of different perspectives. And it gives us an opportunity to balance power, to use power, to use our influence in a variety of different ways. Now, I told you all that we're going to be thinking about power, not just as good or bad, but we want to think about it as something that we can leverage in different settings to achieve different goals. And one thing that directly relates to power is this idea of assertiveness or the ability to communicate the full range of your thoughts and emotions with confidence and skill. This is really difficult and this goes back to that power resource of having the opportunity to communicate freely. So sometimes we can put ourselves in a position where we do have influence, we do have power, we have that power resource to communicate, but then we choose not to for a variety of reasons. So when we're thinking about engaging in assertive communication, we have some tips for doing this. And these are really simple. I'm going to move pretty quickly through them. Um, but the first one is just to simply express how you feel. If you feel uncomfortable with the situation, if you feel like 
the way that you are going, you're being asked to complete a task is unethical, say that, bring that up. And that can be challenging, but it can also be really valuable. It can be really valuable in how you engage in that group or in that organization. Number two here is to specify the behavior objective that you're seeking. So with my example of when I defied my district manager and ended up leaving that position selling solar, I specified specifically, here are the behaviors that I'm being asked to do and here's what I don't like about them and here's how I feel about them and here's what I would like to do instead. And um, I did not get what I was asking and that's okay, you're not always going to, but I inevitably at the end of it felt comfortable, felt good about the situation and the decisions I had made because I had asserted myself and I put myself in a position where I could at least try to gain some influence or some power in that situation. Number three was to identify consequences. So I said specifically, you know, I'm not going to do this. And, you know, I wouldn't always say, you know, giving an ultimatum is a good thing. But in that situation with my district manager, I said, I'm not going to do this. Here's why. Here's what I would like to do instead. And they told me basically that the consequences of me not doing what they asked, the way they asked me to do it was that I wouldn't, I would be fired. And at that point, I identified the consequences and it was either work and do something that I'm not going to feel comfortable with or don't do it and get fired. So I just ultimately, I remained respectful and civil, but I did leave that position and I sought out employment somewhere else simply because I had asserted myself in that situation. And in doing that, I had described my needs, my rights, my desires, my issues with that situation. We communicated about it in an effective professional manner. And ultimately, I came to the decision that I wasn't going to do that anymore. So power and assertiveness and influence, they are constantly changing. And in different settings and different groups and different organizations, we can think about them in a variety of different ways. So just really quickly in review, we defined power as influence. We talked about some of the different forms of power and how we can use those forms of power to do different things from influence others to negate the ability to, of somebody to use their influence or to empower other people. We talked about indicators of power, power resources, power distance, how we can balance some of that power with defiance or resistance strategies or sometimes called dissent strategies as well. And then last but not least, we talked about positive power and assertiveness. I hope at the end of this really brief lecture, you have had an opportunity to change the way that you're thinking about power and hopefully use power, use influence in a more effective way in your life and in the future. Take care, everybody.